in case you wonder, this is Claudia. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll start off. I'm the warm-up act for Claudia, who's, who's the actual kind of star, star attraction here. Um, I'm completely flummoxed because we're a design company at Fjord, and uh, we sent over a PDF, but magically, the font has been messed up in the transition. So I'm, I'm, I'm completely uh, thrown by that. Anyway, um, I'll, I'll try, and, uh, try and cope with that. So, so we got this amazing title, Innovation 2.0. So Claudia and I have been thinking about how to tackle that, uh, that, that, that topic. Um, and we have a few, um, a few things we wanted to take you through. So the first thing we wanted to um, essentially say is that, is that we're now at that stage in, in evolution uh, of technology, of society, of business, that anything, pretty much anything we can imagine, can now be made. And just as some uh, quick proof points of that, let's, let's look at some things that we've imagined, popular imaginations from, from the last 50 years. So let's start with Star Wars. So Star Wars back in 1977 created this amazing world, incredible imaginary, imaginary world. Um, however, today, many of the things that seemed incredible in that movie are pretty much um, standard and they're relatively cheap. So we have drones flying around. Um, increasing co uh, commercialization of drones, and then for a few thousand bucks you can pick up a robot like that. And like the Star Wars robots, these robots are actually playing really nicely with people as well, so they understand where people are and they can communicate and learn from people, etc. Now, when I was a kid, back in Finland, Night Rider, the TV series, you know, this amazing, amazing world from, from you know, America, um, just seemed, seemed wonderful. And at the heart of that was this uh, incredible car, kit. I think it was uh, um, Night, what does it stand for? Night Industries 2000 um, kit. And the kit, and, and kit was, you know, it had, uh, it had a brain and it talked to the driver, it could follow the driver. Um, you know, the driver spoke into his watch and the kit, and, and kit came came zooming up and rescuing him in these awkward situations. Of course, this as well is, is pretty much sort of everyday reality now. So every modern car pretty much that um, comes out of the factory is connected in some way. This is the Infiniti Q50. It has all sorts of connectivity in it. It has, actually has two different connectivity systems and even a personal assistance service that comes as part of that connectivity. And now we have these wearables, these watches that we can actually talk into. So I can talk into my watch and that can connect with, with this car. That happens to be a Samsung device. Now, what's really interesting as well is that when we imagine the future, it doesn't take that long for us to realize it. So two years ago, this amazing movie, Her, came out. And, and it was a really, I think, fantastic uh, vision about you know, how technology and humans will interact in the future. And at the core of that was this operating system that was very human-like. And, and the main character kind of fell in love with that operating system. Now, soon after that, Amazon comes up out with uh, Alexa. Alexa, which is very personal and personable and very human-like. And uh, shortly after that, Facebook comes out, out with uh, Facebook M. Again, another personal assistant that's, uh, um, that's very human-like. And, uh, and that actually makes it five out of five in terms of the big digital drivers on the West Coast in the US who all have this type of personal um, assistance service. And, uh, and lastly, so let's go back in time. So what is this? About 50 years back in time to the first James Bond movie and the supervillains in the James Bond movie. So these imaginary people who, who uh, were very wealthy, they had access to incredible technology, they made these amazing, crazy cars, they made you know, spaceships and so on. And look at today, Elon Musk. <laughs> I don't know where he gets his money. You know, he's, um, he's mysterious, super smart, brainy. And, and he makes things like spaceships. So he makes spaceships, he makes these incredible futurist cars. And then he sits there sort of petting his uh, cat and, and pressing the, the button. And automatically, tens of thousands of cars get a software upgrade and race up and drive at a different height. <laughs> so these are the kind of you know, futures that we imagined uh, through, through science fiction and movies and TV series. And today, they're all realities. We can make anything we want. 
Um, and um, Matthew Bishop from The Economist had, had this amazing quote earlier this year that the pace of change will never actually be as slow as it is today, which I think is breathtaking, the thought of that, because we keep talking about how fast things are changing, but isn't it provocative to say, actually, it's never going to be as slow as it is today, so things are just going to pick up. So we at Fjord, we work with um, lots of different companies. We apply service design to uh, well over 100 companies on an annual basis. And, um, and all of them are struggling with this. Every single one is struggling with this. The pace of change and the fact that change is just uh, going faster and faster, and all their competitors can make anything they can imagine. And as a direct result of all this, people, people's expectations are changing. So people are now expecting change and fast change. And because magic is possible, they expect magic. And what's making things even worse is that the competition for our clients comes not just from within their industry anymore, but from other industries, adjacent industries. So what you see here as an example is banks on the left. So if you're Deutsche Bank or you're Santander, then of course you compete with companies that have, offer products and services that are the same or similar to yours, the other banks, sometimes digital players like First Direct. But going beyond that, um, what's happening more and more now is that there's companies that come out uh, into the marketplace with experiences that actually don't compete directly with your product and service, but experiences that, uh, that, that actually take away the need for some or all of your products and services in the first place. And even worse than that is then the stuff that you have over on the right, which is the per, what we call perceptual competition. So competition that sets new benchmarks, regardless of industry. So once you shop with Amazon, once you're on Facebook, and once you use Airbnb, or countless other examples, your expectation for what good looks like has transformed. And you take that expectation to any industry, whether you're an employee or whether you're um, an end consumer, and you apply that perception of that expectation. So, so this sort of rapid, liquid uh, change of expectations, we call it liquid expectations, and it's a, it's a real challenge. So if you take those two things, the speed of change plus the, the liquid expectation is a massive challenge for our customers. So is this working? Okay, great. So customers expect magic, and innovation is speeding up, and competition is everywhere. So what does that mean? Businesses need to innovate, and this is no longer something that's nice to have. This is a necessity for survival. But innovation is not what people think it is. It's not someone sitting in a room alone with a bubbling cauldron waiting for this brilliant alchemy to happen, and then all of a sudden there's a lightning bolt and there's a disruption that happens in the market. Instead, what we're saying is that it's primarily about evolution. It's about steps that people are working through. It's almost as if you're quilting pieces together to reform a new type of innovation blanket. And so this is what um, Stephen Bishop said, that it was slow hunches. And what you'll see here is that Thomas Edison, even, who's an icon of invention, even said that he starts where the last man left off. So it's really about being able to create small changes that have large impact. So this is a really interesting quote from Stephen Johnson. I'm going to read, if you look at history, innovation doesn't come just from giving people incentives. It comes from creating environments where their ideas can connect. So this is really about the fact that it's really about how you set up your system and your organization, but it's also about what the end result comes from. So collaboration, what does that do? And we've talked, I've heard a few people talking about this. What that will allow is a diversity of thoughts and ideas. And it brings together different points of view so that people can then transcend their own point of view, their own industry, their own capabilities, and be able to think about the adjacent possible. So we're going to give a couple of examples here about some evolutionary innovations that actually had revolutionary consequences in the market. 
the smartphone. So the smartphone actually is not a revolution, right? It's, an, it's actually an evolution of two other innovations, being the cell phone and the computer. And what happened was that the smartphone inventors, when they were thinking through this, understood that we could transcend the cell phone of being beyond just a talking vehicle or implement, but actually expand the idea of what the communication tool could be. I think that you know, we look at the iPhone as exemplary, uh, example of what the smartphone is. I would say that Apple actually has had a history of not creating revolutionary innovations, but what they do is have evolutionary innovations and they exceed expectations in their intuitive design and in being able to exceed customer expectations. Another example is one-click shopping. So Amazon is a, you know, the best example of this and, and the, basically the inventor of this. Amazon, as we know, is a behemoth of e-commerce, but what they also, I think, do even better is that they own supply chain, right? They're able to do supply chain better than anyone else. And what they did was the next logical step for them in terms of distribution. They, put, they were able to reduce the time for purchase and delivery. Seemingly minor type of um, refinement that had massive and immediate market consequences, right? And so it wasn't all of a sudden all e-commerce then had to copy them, but it's not only e-commerce, it was people who are going to the store, who are on the line at Whole Foods, all of a sudden, they're getting frustrated that they have to wait a half hour because they're used to doing things with one click, having it delivered to their home, and having that level of convenience and speed and transparency. So those are a couple of examples of what we've seen in the past. I'm gonna hand it over to Olaf to talk a little bit about what we think about of the future. So if innovation is central to both governments and other public institutions and businesses, and if pace of change is really fast, and um, if it's true what Claudia was saying about collaborative and, um, uh, and evolutionary settings, um, being, being core to innovation. With those examples, then one key question is what's next? What's next for innovation? What is the, the future that we will, um, we will innovate into? Now, is it Internet of Things? Is it connected devices? Is it big data? Is it cloud? All of these ber uh, words, um, from a, who are, which are quite device and technology centric, are, um, are, are um, out there and used on a very frequent basis. And you can use, um, look at the Gartner hype chart for which of them is kind of peaking and which is, which is on the ascendancy or going down. Now, um, we've been thinking hard about this actually for several years at Fjord. And, and, and our view is that it's all of those things, but actually it's all of those things coming together in a service economy, a service constellation that is living and alive rather than static and dead. And, and we believe that we are actually now entering the era of living services. And this is quite profound for businesses, um, society, public institutions, but really profound for us as practitioners and believers in service design because it is the service economy that's at the heart of this next phase of change, in our view. And um, digital is now so inherent in everything we do, any, any major uh, transformation in society and business, that you can't think about these things without thinking about digital. So when you think about digital, what have been the major, major phases of change? And we believe that we're now entering the third. The first one was the web and the internet. The second was all about mobility. And by the way, it's not like we're done with the first or the second. These are still actually disrupting businesses, society, and, 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 and creating change on a daily basis. Um, and they're additive, they build on each other. And the third one, which is kind of the theme for, for this decade, is living services. So it wraps together all of those enablers, you could say, uh, ubiquitous connectivity, data, cloud, and so on and so forth, into, into uh, a package that we call living services. And 
And why do we call them living? And by the way, on the right-hand side there, what you see is, is Google Now, which for, which for us is a very, very good example of a service that's living. But why do we call, call it living? Why do we call that these services living? We call them living because for the first time, we now have the capability to actually do deep, deep personalization around the individual. So Claudia and Olaf, we get individual service experiences. And we do this not just with two people, we do this at scale. So we have the ability to do that, which is really profoundly different. It totally messes with, which, uh, with what's gone since um, the Industrial Re Revolution started. So the mindset and the mentality, which is one, se one size fits all, has been there for hundreds of years. And now we finally have the ability to turn that on its head and deeply customize and personalize for every single, single individual. And the second way that these services are alive and living is that they evolve. So they learn and they evolve and they change over time. They learn around you, uh, about you and your needs and your behavior, but they, they're also constantly in beta. So they're never done. They always evolve and change. And finally, they tend to be very proximate to us. So either because explicitly they are through wearables and nearables, even digestibles uh, or embeddables, but, but also because they feel close to you. Once you take a living service into use and you start using it in, in your daily life, if you take it away, it's actually gonna feel like you've lost a friend or you know, a, a member in your family. It, it, it feels so close. And, um, and, and we believe that, that these services, these living services will actually change, change people's lives in profound ways. And that change comes in, to, uh, um, in two levels. So one is actually about reducing friction and simplifying things. So I don't need to stand in line in order to pay anymore, um, would be one good example of that. Or I don't need to uh, cognitively process so much because stuff is just done for me. So I can delegate stuff and I can simplify my life so I get more time back and more bandwidth back to do the stuff that truly matters, to spend time with my loved ones, to you know, go and enjoy myself, etc. But then the services will also have a different type of effect, which is truly uh, disruptive or truly profound, where you can actually go from these population-based solutions to individual solutions. And we just talked about learning and education, and just there it might be a good example. So it used to be that everyone um, gets the same. Everyone is tested the same way, everyone is taught the same way, everyone learns roughly at the same time in their, in their life and so on, but now, as we push forward living services, we can have individual pathways of learning, and not just in these little um, blobs in your life, but actually continuous learning through your life. So it's profoundly changing the way that education is, is disseminated. And, um, and we believe that, um, um, that all aspects of our lives will be impacted by this. So it's, it's not necessarily the right starting point to look at industries, it's better to look at the environments our homes, our bodies, our families, our education, work, transport, shopping, and so on and so forth, all aspects. And to give an example of, of two of them, to make, to make this sort of uh, relatively abstract concept a bit more tangible, but we're gonna show you a three minute video of something we've been playing with over the last few months. And it's sort of fusing the bodies and families part in here. My name is Jonas Höglund. I'm service design director here at Fjord Stockholm. In 2007, at the age of five, my son Max was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Ever since, me and my wife had to have total control over Max to understand everything about Max's daily activities. Being a patient of a type 1 diabetes means that you don't have insulin in your body anymore, but instead you have to submit it. But to know how much insulin to submit, you need to know all the variables around you. What, what he's doing, what he's eating, how he's sleeping, and so on. Diabetes is a global epidemic. Today, there is 387 million people diagnosed with diabetes. And that number is expected to rise to 592 million people by the year 2030. That is more than 50% increase in less than 15 years. The yearly global cost related to diabetes is 612 billion US dollars. That means that in US, one out of every ninth dollar spent on healthcare is spent on diabetes. But it should not have to be like that. 
Today we're leaving all these digital footprints behind us. We're carrying around the phones with us, we have activity bands. All that data could be put to use to see patterns in the data. And we could do that on an individual level, but we could also do it on a community, on a group level. Fjord Fido will enable to predict from those patterns for the future. The system will provide insulin intake recommendations based on different parameters. The most important thing is to create sort of a system that will digest all that data and provide the most relevant data for the users for them to be able to make the right decision at the right time. We started to find the right parameters or patterns that we want to use for the service. Once you know what problem you're trying to solve, you have to understand the context that that problem exists in and ask all the contextual questions that you need to answer in order to get an understanding of the context. For example, when uh, Max is taking the bike to school, and this is something that we predict throughout reoccurring patterns, we will get a better and more accurate prediction of the need for insulin intake, which is the main purpose of Fido. So for example, taking a breakfast scenario, the system could suggest that you would take less insulin than normal due to predicted activities that you have a planned gym class that day, that you didn't sleep the way you usually sleep, or a prediction of you taking the bike to school. It's going to have a huge impact on people's lives as a living service because it will adapt and change and not only improve one person's life with diabetes but include uh, improving the life of their families, their friends. Why we started this project is this would have an enormous impact on Max's life. The promise actually to give Max his life back and give him the control. As a company there is great business potential in bringing this to the market and not just for diabetes, but as a living service platform for better self-treatment. So, so yes, yeah, so that's just one example, but you can imagine that, so like Shelley pointed out, the change is profound on the individual level, on a family level, and society level. And if you look at, if you think about the, um, the numbers we saw in the beginning in terms of how many sufferers and how much money is spent on, on, on diabetes, if we can make a change with the help of these type of services to um, do that, imagine the, um, the, the, the impact also on a financial economic um, front. It's, it's, it's pretty profound. So, so if you believe in this, the, this direction, and if you believe that innovation is needed, and if you believe that innovation is not happening in pockets or smart individuals sitting, tinkering on their own, but that innovation needs to be integral in businesses and distributed in businesses and collaborative, and if you need to innovate into this living service future, how do you actually go about that? So, as, as you know, um, essentially, to do anything profound, you, you, you now need to cover three, you always need to cover these three perspectives. So the design and the business perspective, that's been talked about quite a bit at this conference, but also the technology perspective is really, really critical. And it's not just about innovating in, in one corner, it's about the system that connects those three. And you do have to have all those three parts um, represented in a, in a very meaningful way in order to do something profound. So you can't actually do one without the other. But if the future is living services, if it's about pushing into and innovating into living services, um, what does that mean to, what, what does that actually um, result to when it comes to those three perspectives in that system? What it actually means is that the design, the type of design that we need to do needs to be living. And we've talked quite a bit about how we do uh, living design, but fusing data into, into the design process, um, thinking beyond the touchscreen paradigm that we live in today, connecting physical and digital experiences, always iterating, always being in beta, um, 
those are elements of, of living design. But also, the technology that we put in place, it crucially has to be living. It has to be able to flex to the customer experience, to the, to the um, uh, experience that we wanted to enable, that we imagined in the first place. So the platforms of yesterday are not good enough. You, you do need living, liquid, and flexible platforms of a totally different kind. Um, and also the business, the operations, the way you think about the business case, the way that you service your customers needs to be living and flexible. So everything in the system needs to become alive and flexible and needs to work as a system in, in, in cohesion. So um, there are a couple of capabilities, I think, that are critical in order to implement this successfully. At Fjord, we have something called creative technologists. And that is, a, again, a linkage between this idea of the technology corner and the design corner. And these, technologi these creative technologists are not people who are developing um, deep code, but what they are doing is they're helping with the exploration of the design and making sure that the design really is something that is um, exceeding customer needs and is something that could be scalable and have a, a um, future vision to it. And so the way that we work with creative technology is it's really an iterative process that we work through together and an interplay between these two disciplines. The, the other area that is essential is business design. So business, a lot of people talk about strategy. Um, business design is actually a real fusion between what we're really calling the kind of old school business and design. Um, I am heading up business design here in the US and I, am, I could say that I actually live that fusion, having both of these experiences in my life and background. But what this really is about is ensuring that the design is not relegated to an implementation phase, but it's really core to the strategy. And so what we need to do is be able, as business designers, to make sure that the design and the outcome is aligned to what the business objectives are. It's contextualized in what the market needs, what the business needs, and that it could provide positive business impact. So how is service design related to this? Service design is a foundational approach to, be, to get a successful outcome across these three disciplines. And there are three parts of this that, are, that make this the perfect uh, foundation. One is that it is, by nature, people-centric and user-centric. So as we move forward in the future of what uh, design is, the default is going to be to look at the customers and the user needs. And the expectations are that the user will want that type of magic. Service design provides that. It's also holistic. It allows all three of those areas within that triangle to be considered and designed for. And it could be adopted for any organization. So finally, in this era in which magic is now becoming commonplace and innovation is considered uh, table stakes, we need to help businesses continually innovate. And by doing that, we have to do a few things. We have to, have, we have to help them understand that the user is central and that the success metric for them is delight and making sure that their customers are delighted by their experience. The differentiation for them will be in the execution, similar to what we discussed with the iPhone, in which it was an evolutionary innovation. The way we design, as much as what we design, is going to be critical. And good ideas on their own are not, not enough. So good ideas that don't make it to market are not good enough. So, so what you do need is, is, is really to ensure that if you use the technical capabilities that the organization 
um, and, and the team has with that, that sort of design intent. So execution is, is really, really paramount. The destination is living services. This is the future. And we need to start thinking about not only what that looks like, but how to, how to work and live within that new construct and how to help businesses start to become more flexible and agile. And the approach in the foundation is for service design. And service design is what's going to help these customers and the businesses together create magic. Thank you. Thank you.